Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Friday live stream. We've got a ton of things to go over, so let's just jump right in, shall we? So the first thing you're probably asking yourself is, uh, what's up with that thumbnail? It seems very negative. And uh, you have a good point. And as Ashley clearly points out, today I don't expect good news from Rob. And Ashley is pretty correct, but I do have some good news, so stick with me. So first of all, it's all about the macro, and that's really what it comes down to. So over the last two or three days, we've had some mixed reports about what's good for the macro, what's bad for the macro. We're going to take a look at all these things. So first of all, jobless claims dropped to an eight-week low. Hiring has slowed, but layoffs aren't rising. So when you get laid off or something happens to you, you can do these initial claims and file for unemployment. And if we can take a look here, and again, as we like to do here uh, on the channel, is to steal all of Ben's data as much as we possibly can. So just going to zoom in real quick. And we can see that initial claims, unemployment rates, or unemployment rate will be later. But we can see that, yes, it has been declining. And this is from 2000, July. And of course, this comes out uh, every week or so. We can see that there's a little bit of fluctuations, but it's down. That would be somewhat of good news. However, employment and jobs added. This is a mixed bag. This just came out. 30 minutes ago or so, employers added 142,000 jobs in August, and the unemployment rate fell to 4.2%. So if we take a look at the unemployment rate, is that good news or bad news? Well, I mean, we talked about this a couple of days ago for our video on recession. Is it coming? And it seems like it is, but again, a mixed bag. We've seen an inversion of the unemployment rate as it's dropped from 2021 went sideways for essentially 2022 and 2023. And as we're coming up here, you see that there's an uptick in the unemployment rate and a maxed out recently at 4.3. And now we're down to 4.2, which is great. People like those numbers. They say, oh, that's good. Unemployment rate is cooling. But remember, it also cooled down here too. We went from 3.9 to 3.8. And then what happened? Bing, 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 bing. And now here we're at 4.2. So that part is good. However, what about those jobs? Well, the jobs report, the gains were weaker than the expectations. The expectations were 161,000 jobs, uh, but we didn't hit that. And we actually, we got down to 142,000. Although if you do take a look at this, again, mixed bag of information, we were on a, quite a decline from May of 24. And we went from 216,000 job gains, 118,000 to 89,000. And now there's an uptick. So you take a look at this, you're like, well, that's not bad. Things look pretty reasonable. So what does that mean for the market? Not too good. S&P 500 is down. Let me refresh this just to make sure because, you know, things change all the time. Eh, no, nah, not really. And then, of course, in our market, which is what I really care about because I'm not really playing around too much with equities. Uh, Bitcoin today is down. Well, I, I know you know because you've checked your portfolio t 20 times today. And we're down 4.2% in 24 hours to 54,000. Maybe we'll go down to 50,000, who knows? So if we have that mixed bag and there's some a little bit of good news in there, what's really going on? I think it also comes down to this. <clears throat> this is why I named, I had the thumbnail, Lies and Revisions. Because it seems like as we get into like these presidential elections, it just seems like the numbers kind of, there's a disparage amongst the numbers of what we actually are, are reported. And then all of a sudden there's like a big revision. I want you to listen to this. And as a note, jobs revisions as of last month when this came out was the largest revision, I want to say, in over a decade. Correct me in the comment section. And it just keeps happening. So let me make sure you can hear this perfectly. I'd like everybody to, to listen in. It's about 30 seconds or so. Just take a listen. Let me. There you go. Listen to this. Be coming across any second now. Let me check the BL. There it is. Uh, 142,000 versus July, which revised down to from 89, to 89,000 from 114,000. June, big revision to 118 from 179. I cannot do the math. Um, somebody do 11. <laughs> One. All right. <clears throat> so we, had, we thought we had 179,000, but it was only 118,000. Whoopsie. I guess that happens. And they just revise those numbers and everybody looks the other way. But it just seems like it just keeps happening and the number starts growing exponentially. I could be wrong. Again, let me know in the comment section. But 
there is those revisions coming in. So we all have, all have to take a look back two, three, four months just to take a look. So there's that issue. And then also yield curves. So let me make sure you can see this. Okay. So the treasury yield, this is why I like Ben's site, because I get to verify everything that I, that I hear from. If you want to check out Ben's site, links in the description, 10% off the first month. But the yield curves, the treasury yield curves, if we're taking a look at the 10 and 2, 10 year and 2 year, we can see that, let me just go back a little bit. There we go, that looks better. So we got the 2 year at 5%, 10 year at 4.29%. And logically, you would say, well, why would I tie up my cash into treasuries for 10 years at 4.2, when I just do it at 5, or maybe 5.4 or 5.5? It's because it's an economic indicator. And we see that it's supposed to look like this, not like this. And then today, September 5th, you're looking at the 10 year curve at 3.73 and the two at 3.75. What does that mean? When we invert and then uninvert, it usually says we're pretty darn close to a recession. And it's happened almost every single time. And we can take a look at, the, look at the 10 and two, or we can take a look at the, the 10 and three month, which we will in a second. But you can see in gray, are these recession areas. We can go back to 1980, look at this one, oof. So it takes here, it inverts, uninverts didn't really hit, uninverts again, crosses back over recession. Same thing over here in 81, you can see it more clearly here in 88. We had an inversion, it uninverts, comes out, uninverts again, recession. This one's a little bit better, 2000. It's a little bit more clear, actually. We invert, uninvert, and when we hit to this point where it just is that baseline, then here comes the recession. Over here, inverts, uninverts. Now we've got a little bit of play. This is from May 07 to December 07. Then we hit a recession. So a little bit of time. And then, of course, the pandemic, here we are little bit comes back over but this one is a big one inverts and now we're at that level which would indicate a recession however that is the 10 and 2 that is what economists usually take a look at they say it's a more reliable predictor but we take a look at the 10 and 3 which is a little bit more susceptible to ranges and the fluctuations of the early markets we can see that that is not true yet but for what we've taken a look at it would be interesting if we were able to totally bypass a recession or push it back into 2026. I'm not for sure. So what does the market say? What should we do? Because this is where it comes down to, maybe we should cut rates, fire up that printer, right? Well, here's the FOMC, the CME group, and what they predicted two days ago from the reports that they had from all the data, they're saying that, okay, the current target rate is five and a quarter to five and a half or 525 to 550, however you want to say it. There was a 57% chance that they thought that the Fed would cut on September 18th by a quarter basis points, or 25 basis points, I should say, excuse me. And a 43% chance of 50 basis point cuts. And now with all this data, what do they say? I would have said, let's start really cutting rates. That's not what the market says. The market is saying as of today, let me refresh this, I, I could be wrong here. Geez, even better. 75% uh, is just 25 basis points. They do not think Jerome is going to do anything more. And they're saying a quarter or 25% chance that it's actually gonna drop off. So we'll see if that's the way. Let me know what you think in the comments section, if they should be more aggressive and cut them 50 basis points and fire up those printers or slow walk it, try to get a soft landing, 25 basis points, let me know in the comments. We'll see where we go. So there is that piece. And the question you might ask yourself, well, this is all great, Rob, but what are you going to do? First of all, I can't give you financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor, not a your dad, obviously. So for me, it's always the same thing. I take a look at this. I go, well, things don't go down forever. They don't sure as heck don't go up forever. I think we learned that in 2017, 2021. Am I right? So I just take a look at the risk levels. 
and I dynamic DCA. If you're not familiar with this, I've talked about it many times. There's a link in the description where I talk about the dynamic DCAing. But as far as like risk levels, we were at 0 0.55, 57, not too long ago, which would have equated to a Bitcoin price of above 70,000. Now we're slipping. 0 .4, 0 0.45. There's been calls for a sub 50K Bitcoin, which we get at 0 0.42. There's been a call for a sub 40K. I don't know if that's going to happen, but who knows? But what if it does? What if it does happen? Are you mentally prepared for that? Because for me, at 0. Actually, 0 0.5.5 or somewhere in there, I've been more aggressively buying. And as we go down, and you can see here that At the 0 0.3 level, 34,000, 0 0.25, 30,000 level. Could you handle buying that? Because this is what it looks like for me. When I'm in these levels, again, 0 0.0 to 1.0. As we start to slip down these levels, I start to buy more aggressively. I learned my lesson last time. And I should have been buying a lot more. So now I'm just like, well, I know it's gonna go up at some point, time to start ripping. So let's say like on 0 0.7 to 0 0.8, this is just an example. You put 50 bucks a week. As it goes down those risk levels to 0 0.6 to 0 0.7, maybe you buy 60 bucks a week. 0 0.5, 70 bucks a week. 0 0.4 and below, maybe it really gets, gets heavy. 80 to $130 per week. Again, just an example. Or you could just do this. Maybe you just don't do anything. I know people will always tell you, well, you got to buy the dip, buy the dip, buy the dip. Maybe you're all dipped out. I don't know. And nothing wrong with doing nothing and just sitting there for, well, I'm just going to wait for the bull run. I got enough. Or thinking to yourself, all right, I'll wait till it gets to 0 0.45 and start buying and then really start to go. It's up to you. And this is why I like to use these risk levels because it gives you a plan of attack moving forward. You're not just sitting here going, what the hell is going on? So you can kind of see things and you can kind of see where things are going. So let me know if that helps you in the comment section. I'm not for sure, but uh, let's, let's move on to some good news, right? I'll give you some balance. Congratulations to uh, XRP holders. Chris Larson, former co-founder and executive chairman, is endorsing Kamala Harris. Hey, all right. So take that as a win, XRP Army. Looks like a co-founder is driving up there with riding with Kamala Harris. Yes. Fantastic. So that's good. And uh, also uh, other news, which maybe not so good. This was a, a post from James Fillon, uh, defense lawyer, former federal prosecutor. And he talks about the, um, the Ripple versus the X SEC case. This was a couple of days ago. And he says the SEC versus Ripple has filed a letter requesting a stay of the monetary portion of the court's judgment entered on August 7th. The SEC has consented to the request for a stay. And Yassine is like me, is like, can someone put this in English? Thankfully, uh, Fred Rispoli, who's an attorney, litigator, and trial lawyer, says, yeah, I can put this in English. It says this, Ripple, we have the check for our... Uh, when they went through litigation, they had to buy, pay a penalty. So we can pay you, SEC. Are you going to appeal this S or not? And the SEC pretty much says, like everybody else, what they tell everybody, centralized exchanges, crypto projects, and the like, we're not going to tell you. Ha, huh. kind of like our entire crypto policy, if you think about it. Ripple states, and of course, we're just paraphrasing, we're just having fun. We will collect all the interest from you if we pay you. You appeal and we win. So the SEC says, okay, let's just enter uh, an appropriate stay order and then we'll get back to you. Meaning we're not going to let you get out so easy. We're going to have a stay order so you can't pay us off and move on. We're the SEC. We're the turd that doesn't get flushed. And that's pretty much it. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive.